Hi everyone, hope you're having a good morning and you've recovered from whatever chaos the latest government announcements have brought. Um, this webinar is one for, um, for me, the unsung heroes of the last 12 months in, in terms of you as finance leaders within your organisations. So it's, it's hopefully a bit of light relief and a bit of forward looking uh, as a break from all the furlough claims or the CBOs applications or the the cash flow forecast on a, on a daily basis. Um, so this is um, so a webinar that will I'll, I'll move on to Tom and, and Renee to introduce themselves shortly, but should give you uh, a, a sort of input into how we as accountants can have a greater influence in strategy rather than picking up the pieces of other people's bad decisions. Um, so uh, again, a bit of housekeeping, there is time at the end for questions so please feel free to ask as many questions as you can and um, we'll try and get through as many as we can and if we don't manage to answer them all in the time we've got today we will we'll come back to you individually and um, so i'll now pass over to tom great thank you very much uh, malcolm morning everyone thanks for joining thanks for your time in terms of the um agenda today this this webinar is very much in two halves so first of all um, Rene, as a, a practicing CFO and also a lecturer in strategy, will be, will be um, giving his view on how a finance leader can, can um, uh, lead and add value to strategy within a business. And then I'll be doing the second half and I'll be sort of pretending to be the chief executive and uh, assuming that you point into a chief executive or want to. Uh, and I'll be giving you the chief exec's view on what it would be really helpful or is really helpful from a, from a finance leader. And then we'll get into poll discussion and Q&A at the end, chaired, chaired by Malcolm. Uh, so first of all, in terms of introductions, very quickly, if this is the first of the webinars that you've been on, that we've been running with Shorts, um, I'm Tom Rick McCarthy, um, I'm co-founder of Lucidity, been involved in lots of sort of growth businesses, three turnarounds, uh, mentor at a growth fund, so lots of growth activity and became a bit of a strategy evangelist um, by having to live, in, live and breathe it in a number of different businesses. Um, Rene, if I can pass over to you. Yeah, um, thank you Malcolm and thank you Tom. Um, thank you for inviting me to this. Um, so I'm the CFO of Crunch, which is a medium-sized um, SaaS business operating the professional services industry. Uh, and have heavily been involved in the development of the strategy for the company for the past um, few years. Um, and as Tom already said, I'm also a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex Business School. Thank you. So if we um, I just also had a look at the, um, at the poll results actually, and, and one, one interesting answer sort of popped up there about sort of not knowing enough about the whole process and, and how and where a finance leader can input into this process. Um, now, clearly, as you can imagine, there are a, a number of uh, different models and approaches to developing a strategy. Um, and, and here on the screen, it, it's just one of them. Um, it's not to say that the others are wrong. It's not to say that this one is the only one, clearly not. Um, but often uh, a strategy um, should start, and, and it really should start with uh, an element of analysis uh, before you can set out or develop a strategy. You need to sort of have a good understanding of, of, of sort of the, the, the marketplace itself at macro and micro level. Uh, I'm gonna first focus on the actual steps and then of course your internal analysis, your SWOT, strategic options, et cetera. Um, as long as in many ways your strategy process covers these elements, if you wanted to start, if you like, if it's because it's more appropriate to start with an internal analysis and then do the external analysis, absolutely fine. Um, if you want to do the strategic objectives before your strategic options, absolutely fine. Uh, that is not really a right or wrong, and we have seen sort of different approaches by different organizations. But starting sort of with the first one, that is the external analysis. And, and if there are parts of the process where a finance leader, be it a CFO, an FD, um, or even at, at different levels in the organizations are 
sort of rarely involved, it is that sort of external analysis. And, and as you can see at the top there, there are actually parts that are best suited for a finance individual to analyze. Uh, if we look at sort of the bigger macro trends in an industry, then it is not just about, if you like, geopolitical uh, tension or changes or situations. Um, it, it, it's also often about well, how actually is the economy in the, in the country, in the market that we're operating, how is it actually performing? What, what is the underpinning um, sort of factors that drive that economy, for example? What about taxation? And particularly currently, and taxation is a, a hot topic. And we know that uh, the government it is indeed looking at, at ways to fund um, the, the amount of money they have spent on, on sort of supporting us in this country about uh, coping with COVID and of course, repaying at some point the, the huge amounts of monies that have gone into it. Well, so therefore as a finance leader, we need to start developing views on what taxation might do in the future. Same, same with uh, exchange rates. If you are exporting or importing, taking a view, particularly now that we are in, a, in sort of the, the post-Brexit situation, so we're now separate from, from Europe in many ways, what is that going to do to exchange rates? These are all classic things and also had the funding structure, I put up the word funding there, which is in itself a, a complex issue. How, what are the funding structures in this country or should we be tapping potentially into funding from abroad? And, and what does that look like? And the same, of course, with lending. That's at sort of that macro level and at the micro level, which often sort of involves just competitors and supply chains and customers, also there, the finance leader can play an important role. And take, for example, a competitor analysis. That should not just be about, well, what product do they have? What service do they have? What are their USBs? What is their marketing, if you like? Huh? How, how creative is it or how effective is it? Clearly that needs to be done, but also we should look at um, a good complete analysis should also look at, well, what is the financial makeup of our key competitors? And not just the ones that we are directly competing with, but also potential newcomers to your, to your market or industry. What is their makeup? What is their access to capital? Um, so these are uh, important bits and the same in many ways with, with consumers. It's not just looking at your typical consumer behavior changes, but also what are the changes to the consumer budgets and their preferences for, for funding certain, certain purchases? Um, would, would the customer sort of tap into credit cards again or get, getting various loans perhaps to, to fund an acquisition of something? Um, how is that going to work? And of course, we have the differences between B to C, um, business to consumer, as well as B2B, where we look at businesses uh, to whom we're selling. And clearly such analysis when we're selling to businesses can, can contain a lot more detail when it comes to that. So already right at this first step, the finance leader is involved and contributing with their analysis to the overall picture that is being developed. And now moving on to the internal analysis, Perhaps more what we uh, where we have been been involved with in, in sort of in the more traditional sense, but certainly also not avoiding or, or certainly seeking to participate in discussions about a, a return on investment in terms of marketing. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, for those of you that have engaged with your with your marketing colleagues in the business. It, it always makes them a little bit uncomfortable uh, when, when, when they're being approached about, all right, so you've just spent X thousand, X hundred thousand, X million, whatever your budget or marketing, but actually what was the return on that investment? And in the olden days, clearly it was very difficult to establish that. You often had to go outside to a market research agency to get a, a good feel and a good handle on that. But these days, with where a lot of the marketing is done 
through and via the internet, we have a lot more opportunity to properly and in detail analyze a return on marketing. We as finance leaders should play a role in that um, and ask those critical questions that need to be answered. Clearly also our hard lens in terms of our uh, sort of uh, analysis is what's our financial makeup? What's our balance sheet in particular? What does that look like? What is our access to capital? How easy is it for us to get either an extension on a current facility or a new facility? Or if it is needed, can we attract, if you like, some, 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 some private capital or capital perhaps even from a VC to, to fund a particular strategy or growth? Likewise, also, uh, we should extend our, our focus and our view on suppliers. What, what is the financial position of key suppliers into us? Key partners with whom we may have an important R&D development going on. What is their financial position? Because the last thing we want, of course, is that uh, either suppliers in, suppliers in particular, but also um, sort of partners that are important to the future of business going under as a result of overstretching themselves financially. We ought to be aware of that and on top of that. So those are two, uh, the external and the internal part, are two very important foundation stones for the next phase, uh, which is the development of a SWOT. And, and I can't emphasize this enough. A SWOT is not an analysis in its own right. A SWOT is just a summary of your external analysis and your internal analysis, because your strengths and weaknesses are coming from your internal analysis, clearly and obviously. Your opportunities and threats are indeed coming from your external analysis. So once you have established that, then that ought to be a succinct, pithy overview of that analysis. Because if the external and internal analysis are done really well, you end up with a lot of data. Now that clearly needs to be summarized so that you and your management team can make good decisions on the basis of that analysis. So you're not going to have the different people involved in that sort of analysis. They're not going to, if you like, send to the management team, to the board, if you like, hundreds and hundreds of pages of data, because what are they going to do with it? That needs to be interpreted. That needs to be summarized. Well, that's a power, a SWOT is a powerful tool for that. And at that point, or earlier on in the process, you then develop your, uh, your vision and your mission, which also needs to be articulated in a very succinct and clear and plain English manner. So that everybody is clear, and not only just within the board who have been part of discussions, but clearly also uh, the rest of the people in your organization, as well as potentially uh, a version of it to your customers, to your suppliers, to your partners. So also as finance leaders, we play a role in that because often we have an eye for detail. We, we can see through, if you like, some ambiguity in wording or an opaqueness in, a, in an element of phrasing that, they, that perhaps others have done. So that's a, a key step too. Then we're going on to the next phase. Okay, so we've done all of this analysis. We have sort of set out and we've summarized it. We've set out our vision and mission. We then need to, in partnership with our strategic objectives and goals, et cetera, we then need to develop a number of strategic options. And it's always good to look at it as a process of developing options. Uh, we always advise any organization, small or large, to not just have one particular strategy with which they're going to achieve their objectives. Always good to have two or ideally three. Clearly, finance plays a role in that too. Uh, not only just um, through um, producing a forecast uh, that, that, that is associated or in connection with each option, but of course also making sure that these options are actually based on facts and figures from that external and internal analysis. And not just, um, and we've seen this often as well, not just almost ignoring all that fantastic work that is done, and actually then just saying, oh, yeah, well, we, we're going to just do what we've always done or my intuition, my gut feel tells me that we should this, that or the other. 
that's not good enough. Uh, you have done that analysis for a good reason. The finance leader needs to ensure that whatever options are developed are rooted and grounded in that sort of detailed analysis. Clearly, we then need to, we end up with two or three options. They need to be appraised. Uh, they need to be sort of weighed up against each other. And then a final decision needs to be made which one is going to be adopted. And it could be that there are two adopted. Maybe in time, they are different. Or if we're anticipating a certain competitor response, that we then pull out option strategy B, if you like, to then pursue with it. Then the next stage in there, uh, and clearly how we have perhaps a bit more familiarity with this, uh, the setting of strategic objectives uh, in partnership with those strategic options, the goals and the tasks, uh, the, the nuts and bolts, what are we going to achieve, by when, in which market, etc. cetera. Uh, that, that precise detail, uh, often we make relevant reference indeed to those smart crafted objectives as uh, so they need to be specific, they need to be measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And clearly, um, we as finance leaders are, are almost best placed to make sure they are precise because of our our view on and, and our and, and, and our makeup as individuals. Then, of course, we move on to the execution, and then it's all about implementing this and that is not just a matter of saying right let's just get on with it now let's go and do this now we have, there's a lot of communication involved to all the stakeholders of your organization be they internal or be they external and also that communication needs to be clear and precise that so everybody knows what they need to achieve in all of this and of course we then have, as, as finance leaders are then uh, sort of really playing an important role in making sure that the, uh, the required resources are made available for the implementation of that strategy. Um, and, and, and those resources could be financial, could be otherwise, but they often have a financial implication. And that there is genuine, as I put there, intent and focus by everybody on implementing that strategy. And again, we as finance leaders can input into that process. And then finally, and again, there that is perhaps more, but perhaps more familiar with this, is establishing clear KPIs that link to our smart objectives. And there is clearly a link there. A thing that we set out what we want to achieve, that we have key performance indicators that are developed, that are precise, that do relate, first of all, to our strategy, and second, of course, the objectives that we have set out, that they are properly communicated and understood uh, how often have we not been in positions where we have set out or developed a number of KPIs which are only understood by the board and not the rest of the organization that's clearly not good enough and we must make sure that everybody understands and plays and understands also their role in achieving those KPIs and of course that we have very clear dashboards and, and reporting systems in place that reports on a very regular basis the performance against those KPIs. And particularly these days, again, with the helping hand of technology. Uh, and if I also look at Crunch, how we, we have sort of dashboards that are, uh, that are clearly focused on all our KPIs, that are apps that's live data, that I can just log in and see how the business is performing at that point in time on all of the key KPIs. Um, very important, uh, and, and, and that's, uh, again, a role where the finance leader uh, should play a role in. So as you can see, as a summary, that regardless almost a process that your organization um, has adopted and is familiar with, the finance leader actually plays a role in every single step. Some of them we're perhaps more au fait and comfortable with, given our, our past involvement, Others, we perhaps need to put a case forward that we can assist in that process and we have a genuine, important role to play. Thank you. Tom, over to you. Great, thank you, Rene. Really good, really interesting, thank you. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, move on and use a, um, a case study um, and I'll put on a, a chief exec's hat to give you some perspective or the chief executive's perspective on what a finance leader can do to help and to play a role in the company strategy. 
And what I'm going to do is use a real example, which was a software SME um, going back a few years um, that was um, distressed. Um, and we turned that around, um, got that onto a really good trajectory. And, and during that process, we hired in um, a finance leader, finance director, who was also a, a real expert in strategy. And actually, they come from a much bigger business where they were strategy director. So we had sort of a Rolls Royce approach to strategy. Um, and putting in place um, and executing out that strategy, the, the distress business over a number of years then stepped through. Um, you know, uh, it became a market leader. Um, you know, there was really good revenue growth, really good profit growth, um, international expansion, and then also a number of sort of aspects of um, external recognition um, that were very much part of the strategy. Um, but it, and it was good to get external recognition that, that the business was doing well. So that's the sort of case study we're going to use. The first thing I want to do is just establish what, what is a strategy and to get across the point that, you know, strategy is not that complicated. It can appear a little bit nebulous, but it isn't really. Um, a strategy, uh, first of all, so what's the vision? You know, what's the, what's the where, where do you want the business to be three years time, five years time, whatever that timeline is, but what, what is that sort of vision for the business in terms of where it wants to go? Um, the next um, level down, if you like, or, or supporting that are strategic objectives. So these are the handful of big, important things, could be financial, could be operational, could be to do with people, could be to do with customers, handful of things that are going to support that vision. And we'd sort of typically expect to see three to six of those. Less than three, you probably not thought hard enough. More than six or seven, probably trying to do too much and you'll fail. So a handful of strategic objectives there. And then next level along, goals, initiatives that are going to make those strategic objectives happen. So here we're going to start getting into, okay, three million revenue at a 25% margin by 2024. So we're starting here to create KPIs against goals and initiatives that support the strategic objectives. And then lastly, on the right, a whole bunch of tasks that are then broken down, distributed across the business for everyone to get on with and do and deliver. And that, in a nutshell, is a, a strategy, the components of the strategy, and also a realistic structure of what a strategy really is. And as you can see, it's, it's not complex. So we get back to that little case study of the, of the software business um, and the process that we went through there. And what you'll probably start to see here is um, a, an alignment, a, a close alignment with, with Rene's um, presentation and, and coming at this from a completely different direction. So if we look at what um, we went through there with that particular business. Um, so first of all, we did some internal and external analysis. So we use SWOT and PESL. Neither of these tools are particularly complicated. I would imagine everyone, or most people on the call are probably familiar with them or heard of them. And I'm pretty sure everybody on the call could, could get, get to grips with them and, and do a good job of using them. So not, you know, not hugely complicated. I think there's a, there's a key message here, which is to keep things simple. Good strategy, in my opinion, is simple. And actually, if you make it too complicated, that's when things start to go wrong and, and, and things start to fail. So keep it simple. So a couple of external tools there. The next step then was to sort of um, to look at revenue segmentation. So where is the revenue and profit coming from? And absolutely a CFO, FD, finance leader, you know, should be front and center in supporting that particular analysis, providing that data, you know, leading the discussion, providing the facts to the team. Facts, data, the objective. So clear, clear role for the finance leader there. The next step on in this process was um, start, stop, continue, which I'm going to come to in, a, 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 in the next slide, actually, in a, in a bit of a bigger way. But this is about strategic focus. Where do you focus and where do you not focus? What do you decide to do and what do you not decide to do? OK, and that's a really key moment in the strategy. And I'm going to talk about why finance lead is really key at that moment. Um, vision, setting out the vision and then strategic objectives and goals. But, uh, you know, exactly as sort of Rene, Rene touched on. And then it was a case of planning together and communicating relentlessly. And I'll, I'll come on to that again in, in a second. So the point here, folks, is that this was um, the approach that we took in that particular business in terms of the strategic process. It's really not complicated. 
and, and from the previous slide and the results, it had a massive effect on the business. So in terms of um, the, the sort of choice and strategic focus, now, um, this is a really important point. So strategy is about choice. What are you gonna choose to do? And therefore, what are you not gonna do? Because you can't do everything. And I think CFO, FD has a sort of a really critical role at this point in a strategy. And in a workshop environment, for example, you know, one or two day workshop, this is a really key moment in the discussion because you have to decide what to continue, what to stop doing and what to start doing. And the reason being that, you know, if you're going to start some new activities to drive growth, you know, most activity, most strategic activities around growth, you've got to stop doing certain things to enable you with your resources to start doing the new stuff. So if we just go across this slide, so continue, you want to continue the things that are good and high revenue, good and high profit, you know, things are flat or they're growing, customers are healthy, and they're not toxic for the business, and the business can compete there in some way. The things that you absolutely need to stop as part of a sort of a strategy are things that are not really contributing, revenue, profit, growth, you know, these activities or services or customers, they are in decline longer term or things that things are resource intensive for you, they're difficult and, and they could be toxic, really quite toxic. And this can come down to individual customers or customer types that drain the life out of your business. People leave, you can't recruit, and all of a sudden actually you have a strategic problem and, and you need to stop things where you can't really compete. And then of course you want to focus on um, the, the new activities. So start doing new products, services, customers, geographies where you're gonna see substantial revenue, good to high profit, good to high growth. You know, this is healthy activity, not toxic. You can compete, you've got a competitive advantage. So this is a sort of a very basic framework or, or post thinking process um, to go through, um, continue, stop, start. And, it, and it's a really key moment, I think, in a strategy. Where I think a CFO finance leader plays a really critical role um, are uh, in these two, these two places here. Because when you, you have to decide to stop certain things, so that could be shutting down certain products, that could be shutting down certain offices. And of course, if you've had people and teams that have worked on those products for a number of years, or, or, you know, or their employment is directly connected to them, et cetera, then you know, that, that, that they, they're, they're difficult issues. Um, and you have to be really objective as the finance leader, really objective there and, and brave, you know, in helping those decisions to be surfaced, looked at properly, objectively based on facts, and then the right decisions to be made in the right way. And I think that, that that piece there for finance leaders is a really sort of critical moment and a really important role to play. And secondly, on the right there, a really important thing for finance leaders to do is to make sure that the new activity is funded properly. Strategies really often fail for these two reasons. Um, people are not brave enough to, to stop doing certain things and people um, and or new, new initiatives, new activities are not funded properly. And quite clearly, I think finance leaders have a really critical role to play at this moment in the formulation of a strategy be objective and help those decisions to be made, and then really make sure that you're funding new activities properly because otherwise they will fail and you're front and center in that decision and, and activity. Um, McKinsey, have a, um, McKinsey guys have a, um, a, an expression for this and they call it peanut butter. And that is that resources, because brave decisions aren't made and things aren't funded properly, scarce resources are spread too thinly across an organization or too thinly across a strategy. And sure enough, they fail because you're trying to do too many things rather than reducing the number of things you're doing and the new activities are not, are not funded properly um, and, uh, you know, and things are spread too thinly. So that's the analogy they use and it, and it is very much a, a real problem. So if we get back to the, the, the chief exec and, and, and the finance leader and what was going on there and how can a finance leader really make a difference for a chief exec and, and for the business? The first thing is, um, is for a finance leader to really own strategy. Chief executive has got a million things to think about 24-7, 365, ranging from government policy all the way down to 
what your employees are writing about you on Glassdoor, okay? A huge amount to think about all the time. Now, strategy is like um, a, a, a gorilla in the room, really, for the success of the business. Um, it's really important, and it's also, it's, it's an ongoing event. You know, stra strategy is not a two-day workshop in a hotel. Strategy is all year. So, um, so to have a finance leader who really takes control and responsibility for strategy at company level is a, is a massive benefit to a chief executive, someone they can rely on, the, the chief exec's ultimately responsible, but to rely on someone who's going to take ownership of strategy and, and help, help to manage it, it's really important. Another thing to do is to get the right approach, and that is to choose an approach that works well for your team and your business. I would err on the simple, and what you need to do is to think about the, the lowest common denominator on the team. There is no point coming up with a really complicated approach, really complicated tools that the rest of the management team are not going to engage with. Um, it, it, your, your strategy is not going to get started, let alone finish in a good place. So you've got to think about what's the right approach for your team and your business. And you, need to, you do need to be somewhat knowledgeable. If I think back to that particular finance director, they were really expert in strategy. They were expert in the tools, but in a good way. Supportive, they weren't preaching. You know, if people needed help, they provided that help. And that worked really well. So be knowledgeable about the subject, but in a way that you can help everybody contribute to strategy. Because, and you need to help to organize this. It's, you know, strategy is the, the cliche is, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but it's really true. So many businesses go off site for the two day event and think that's it, it's done. And it goes into the bottom drawer for the year. Um, it, it strategy is, is, is all year. Um, it's not something that happens overnight. You know, you're, you're looking at a three year plan or a five year plan. So organize and plan the process to be sustainable because people will get tired um, you know, they, you, you need people engaged on an ongoing basis and you need to think about how you can organise things to support that. And it's really important to facilitate and not direct. So it may be that the chief executive, um, you know, leads, leaves you responsible for sort of management of the strategy, but it doesn't mean that you have got to come up with the company's strategy. No one is as smart as everybody on the team. Let the team come up with it. Your role is to facilitate your role is not to direct, and that's a really important point. Clearly, you know, um, CFOs, FDs, being um, a, a bit of a generalization, I appreciate, but, you know, pretty well equipped um, in terms of aptitude, skills, and access to systems uh, uh, around planning. Um, um, and so, but, but I think the really important thing that Rene touched on is make it clear and easy, because this is all about engaging the team over a longer term really key point about planning which i'll come to in more detail is around accountability and it's critical that you make sure that there's no ambiguity around who's accountable for what the funding funding things properly as we touched on start stop continue really important that you fund initiatives properly and realistically okay stop doing the things that don't make a difference stop doing things so that you can create some space in the business some oxygen to focus on the new stuff right and you're very well positioned to um, facilitate those decisions um, you know, in a good way. Don't spread things too um, thinly. And then in terms of monitoring, then you should absolutely be enabling sort of regular monitoring, at least on a monthly basis in terms of um, you know, um, progress against goals, initiatives, KPIs, et cetera. And, um, you know, and what you need to think about is how can you create the space for the management team to do this? Monitoring progress against strategy should be at the top of people's to-do list. And quite often it's at the bottom of people's to-do list and therein lies a problem. So, you know, have a think about how you and your role can enable um, easy monitoring and for people to create that space. And really that, that feeds into the last point, which is around removing friction. Friction kills strategy, okay? Someone's got a PowerPoint, someone's got a spreadsheet, they're both out of date and neither of them match up. And just that basic um, friction around strategy, what, what's going on, who's doing what, wh what are we aiming for? That friction can kill strategy so easily. So think about single platform, use good tools, make sure it's really coherent and make sure it's easy to use. And again, you know, I think finance leaders are 
very well positioned to think about that and put in place those platforms and tools to make things easy. So um, the next couple of slides are, are about sort of um, good, good and bad practice. And rather than focus on the, the negative stuff there, I'll, I'll focus on the, the sort of more positive stuff around driving strategy as finance leader. So if you look at strategy in, term, in a couple of big, big, big steps or big components, so formulating alignment, which is around communication and then execution. So in terms of formulation, as we've sort of largely touched on already, you know, strategy should be a, a sort of a regular activity, not, not an annual event. And it's really important that you enable true alternatives to be discussed. You quite commonly see someone show up at a, a strategy session with 200 slides that they're going to machine gun everyone it with. That's not discussing true alternatives. That's someone who's already decided what they want the strategy to be, and they, they're just trying to get to yes. So, you know, discuss true alternatives, be bold, demand data and facts. Now you're very well positioned to surface and provide facts so that things can be discussed objectively based on data. That's a really important thing to do and clearly you're well positioned to do that. We've touched on start, stop, continue, make sure you fund things properly and be a leader, you know, just, you know, contribute to those decisions. In terms of the middle here, so communication we've not touched on much, but this is really, really important. Um, so a couple of facts for you. So uh, about a third of managers don't understand what your company's strategy is. They don't know what your strategic objectives are. And when you get down to frontline sales and service staff, then only actually about 13% of the employees in sales and service know what your strategy is. So if you think about that for a second, that's sort of quite concerning. So most of the people who are responsible for your customers and for your bringing your money in don't really know what the plan is. And a lot of your managers don't. So quite clearly, the risk of failure is really high. So you have to communicate. Communication is a really, really important part of strategic execution. Um, you've got to communicate really regularly. So every week, make it interesting, keep it simple, you know, make sure people understand. So that last business we took through to invest from people gold. And to get to gold was about two things. One was employee well-being, and the other one was strategic communication making sure every employee was really clear on what the plan was and also how they contributed to it. Um, and that comes from good communication regularly. If, if communication isn't a, a natural skill, then work with someone on the senior management team where, who, who are stronger at communication. So uh, stereotypically sales or marketing, um, but you know, don't underestimate the value of communication the other thing, the last thing is, um, with all due respect, no one likes looking at spreadsheets on a weekly basis. So, you know, make it interesting, you know, design things up, make it, make it look good, uh, make it, make it, um, you know, create something that employees want to engage with. People just don't like looking at spreadsheets the whole time. Lastly, on the right, execution. The, the top point there is the most important. So you've got to really work hard to make sure that there's no ambiguity about who is responsible and accountable for what. And, and that is such an important point in terms of execution. The moment there's some ambiguity, then you've got a problem. So as a CFO, FD, you should be well positioned to make sure you've got the right resources in the right places, monitoring is there. Try to help with consistency. So coming back wearing the chief exec hat, it's really time consuming and takes a lot of energy to sit down with each of your direct reports on a senior management team. And, and actually, Rene touched on this. Um, you've got to cut through what people are telling you to try to figure out what's actually going on, okay? And everybody, each of those SMT members has a slightly different approach. Now, if you can put in place tools and, and, and an approach to your strategy, reporting, et cetera, that just helps with consistency, that's massively valuable to the senior management team, and hugely, hugely valuable to the CEO, because they can engage with every aspect of the strategy in a very coherent way and not waste time and energy trying to figure out what's going on. And the, and the uh, next point here is an important one too. And that's not to allow things to slip backwards. So um, in the non-exec work I do, I see myself as a one-way valve. And by that, I mean, um, if you help the team move forward with a strategy, then I just prevent them trying to sort of move backwards. You've got to keep teams moving forwards. And I think a finance leader can play a really important role here on a senior management team 
by keeping everyone moving forward and being the one way valve. If it's not the chief exec, why not? Why isn't it the finance leader? Lastly, make things easy. You know, um, everyone's busy. Um, strategy is a long term thing. It's, it's not a sprint. So make it easy so people can continue to engage with it in an easy way. A couple of slides um, um, just to um, bring to life um, or another, uh, another uh, representation of uh, some of the things that Rene touched on. So, you know, goal setting, good practice. This is so, so simple and yet we so often see it not done. And I think finance leaders are well positioned to just ensure this level of detail and diligence. So here are some goals, 15 million pound turnover by 2025. 75% of revenues recurring by 2025 or being in the Times top 100 in 2022. That is good practice, clear and concise, numbers, timings, deadlines and owners, okay? What we really often see and where a finance leader can um, improve things is, is this sort of thing, change program, team design or marketing plan. All a bit vague, all ambiguous, timing's not clear, success isn't clear. Um, and this sort of thing is, is the sort of thing that kills um, results being delivered in, in, in the end. So for example, good practice with the marketing plan would be something like a marketing plan to deliver X leads by year Y. That sort of attention to detail, I think a finance leader is very well positioned to add value across a, finance, a, a senior management team. So last couple of slides, and then I'll hand back to Malcolm. Um, just very quickly on Lucidity, if you have, uh, if this is the first webinar you've been on. So we have built and grown and turned around a few businesses and got involved in strategy um, from that perspective. And we wanted to take the friction <laughs> out of strategy and make it a lot easier than it was. So we built out a software platform that's used by SME and mid-market businesses to really nail their strategy, to figure out what to do, to build out and execute the plan, make it easy to align teams, um, and then to make it really easy to see what's going on and, and monitor progress. Shorts have been a customer of ours since the middle of last year um, uh, and, and, and um, have really thoroughly tested out the, the platform and, and really like it and endorse it. So do speak to Malcolm. Um, in terms of the, the components, so lots of tools to help you figure out to figure out what to do as a team and of course, you know, collaborate with your colleagues building out a plan in, in a really clear way, in a really clear structure, so you can see what's going on, what's important, and equally what isn't important. Being able to sort of look at that plan um, and, and task management in all sorts of different ways for all sorts of different teams. Lots of flexibility here for people to build what they want. Um, and then just surfacing all sorts of data. So we, we integrate with various systems and you can pull that data into dashboards to help you see really easily what's going on. Um, and lastly, just going back to that communication piece um, that we're passionate about. Um, so platform automatically creates up really good engagement, engaging um, imagery that, that can be used to engage employees, investors, shareholders, partners, et cetera, um, in, a, in a way that saves time and money for, um, for our customers. On the left, we work with all sorts of different businesses. So the platform's hugely flexible, irrespective of what sector you're in. In the middle there, all of our customers are managing growth. It's all about growth. And we're, we're making that growth um, more likely and also easier to manage. And then lastly, on the right there, we've got customers all over the world, actually, um, who are using the platform and collaborating as teams on, on their strategy. So that hopefully just gives you a bit of an idea about who we are and as I said please do speak to Malcolm follow up with Malcolm if you're interested as um, shorts are a user um, and they're increasingly using the platform with their customers at which point Malcolm I'll hand back to you okay thanks Tom thanks Rene um, so I think for me that's a, a really good overview of how we as finance leaders can have a greater involvement in a company's strategy um, so I'll just quickly touch on the, the poll results because we've actually had quite a few really good questions. So I, I, I'd rather spend a bit more time on that if I may. Um, so I'll just remind you very quickly on the three questions. So the first one was, what level of engagement do you currently have with strategy development? The second was, what level of engagement would you ideally like to have? And the third was, what needs to change to make this happen? So... Um, in terms of a summary and the themes running through those three questions, so for me, unsurprisingly, there's a real mix of answers to that first question. Um, I think this is what consistent with what I see. So some businesses where the, the, the FD or the CFO is really involved, it, 
uh, and there's some where they're, they're a bit detached. Um, but moving on to the second question, it's clear that most want a greater involvement than they have currently, um, which then obviously, uh, again, is consistent with what we're then seeing in the third answers of people want to be included more, but also, um, as Rene touched on before, it's a case of there's a, there's a gap in understanding on, on, on how or what, what people need to do to make that happen. So hopefully some of the content we've had today helps bridge some of that gap. Um, and then finally, there's always, as, as I touched on at the start, um, the Unsung Heroes of the past 12 months, it's, it's the time that we have to, to do what we'd like to do as well as doing everything else we, need, we, we, we feel we need to do at the time. So just, just moving on to the, the questions. Um, so the first one, so again, there's, there's a few of, of sort of broadly similar themes, so I'll, I'll summarise um, where I can. So the first one is, um, I think for you, Tom, so what proportion of time did your strategy leading FD spend on the strategy work um, that, 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 that someone's just trying to find out how... how how they how they find that time yeah okay that's an, uh, yeah that's a good practical question um so they um they owned um the strategy in terms of the sort of organization around it um and really what that meant in in practical terms was um when we did have major uh, reviews say uh, uh, on a quarterly basis they would facilitate in, in a workshop setting they would lead and facilitate that that sort of workshop Type, type approach. So the organization around that. Um, if we look at things on a monthly basis, um, then they and their team were providing, making sure that we all had the right information as to sort of progress against the strategy. Um, so that was sort of stuff that was looked at on a, on a monthly basis and, and all of that information being there, whether that was for the senior management team or whether that was for, that was for the board of directors in the monthly board meeting. Um, and then on a weekly basis, in management, you know, weekly management meeting or however the businesses are run, and we, we would have a weekly management meeting, then I think um, then if anything was discussed in the weekly meeting that was relevant to the strategy, and of course often things were, then, um, you know, that, that, that conversation was just nurtured and well structured and, 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 and followed up on. So it was a bit of an ongoing, so it's an ongoing responsibility really of general organisation, general sort of diligence, support, etc. from the leader and then the team, the finance team, um, just making sure that the information was provided in a format that was good and when people needed it. Um, so that was sort of like an ongoing activity for the team, not hugely beyond what a finance team would be doing anyway, you know, in terms of management accounts and reporting for the board, et cetera. But just with that focus on strategy and strategic objectives, goals, initiatives, et cetera. OK, so, so as, as moving on to you, Rene, because obviously uh, part of your role as CFO at Crunch. Yeah, indeed. Um, it, it's and I've also looked at some of the questions that are coming through and it's 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 really interesting um, clearly those that are already involved to a significant extent in that sort of strategy development process they probably want to go a bit further but there are a good number of answers where the finance leader thinks that they are not sufficiently involved and I think what is almost then needed in that organization is a sort of a repositioning of that role and uh, that, that the finance leader is not somebody that just sort of so now and then produces some management accounts yeah. and then chucks that over the fence and so there you guys uh, end of the month there are your management accounts and off they go um in order to establish that sort of repositioning of the role i think there are a number of things that the finance person themselves can do and take that starting point of management accounts i've been in so many management meetings and board meetings where the, the Manex were presented in such an intelligible way that nobody had to, other than the finance person, nobody actually understood what the performance of the business was. Well, if that is your approach to reporting on the financial performance and well-being of the company, does that sort of open the door to you being invited <laughs> to participate in strategic development? Uh, far from it. On the other hand, if on a monthly basis or quarterly basis, whatever, however frequent you do this, you can present 
a clear overview uh, that is readily understood by all the people around the table or on the Zoom call these days, the financial performance of the business and relating that to the strategy the business has set out, already you're throwing the door wide open to be included in those discussions. Mm. The second one I think is, is interesting, um, and I did this actually in, in crunch, um, not that sort of my role needed to be sort of further confirmed because I was involved for, in the strategy from day one, but it just reinforces that role. Is I, I once, um, and I did this sort of as my own little project uh, because I, having spoken to the sales and marketing people, I understood that they had a lack of genuine understanding of how the different segments in the, the market that we are serving were developing. So I thought, you know what? I'm sure there is some data on the Office for National Statistics, eh? ons.gov.uk. And yes, lo and behold, I found an enormously big spreadsheet with lots and lots and lots of data. If I had then taken that spreadsheet, emailed that to my sales and marketing colleagues, they would have not used it. Uh, a bit what Tom said earlier. Um, there are only a few people in the world that genuinely likes to look at spreadsheets <laughs> on a daily basis. Uh, clearly we do. But um, so if I had just emailed that, it would not have been used. So what I did, I then looked at all that data, did some analysis, produced some really insightful graphs and, and, and call it pictures. That's what I send to the sales and marketing team, as well as other members of the board. Saying, oh, here is some interesting analysis. Have a look at it and see how this may help you in your, in your the, the targeting of your different segments. And of course, again, with that, you're showing that you're more than just somebody that can do some number crunching at the end of a period and then report in, an, in, a, in a language that nobody understands on the performance of the business. It is that sort of proactive behavior. And then the final example I have that all helps with this, with this sort of repositioning of the role, I once got from a, um, a, a, an industry trade body, uh, a survey, to complete. And, and normally uh, in, 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 in sort of previous times, I probably uh, somebody would have sent it on to the CEO or somebody else to complete. And I thought, oh, you know, what? I'm going to complete this. Because what the promise was that once I had completed it, two months or so thereafter, when they had done the analysis, I would receive a full industry report. And of course, two months later, I received a full industry report, digested that, and then presented that to the board. And clearly how that, that again showed that this role, that this individual is not just somebody that reports on past performance, but actually is able to intelligently engage with everybody in the management team about the strategy, about where things are going in the marketplace and our performance within it. So I think because there are a few questions about, well, how can I make this happen? How can I be involved more? My simple answer would be find little opportunities to start repositioning your own role in the organization. And whether it is a clearer presentation of the results of whatever stage, or whether it is some, some, some segmentation analysis you have done or a, a, a marketing ROI analysis that you have done or an industry report, whatever it is, find little opportunities to to shine almost a different light on you mm. as a finance leader in that business. And I think then you're almost leading by example and mm. you, will be, uh, you will be invited almost automatically in, in such discussions and will become an invaluable member of the team also when it comes to the development of a strategy. Okay, thank you, Rene, that's great. Um, so you, you've you helpfully managed to answer about four or five of the questions we've got. So. Um, <laughs> Just, I think for me as well, on the time point, um, one of the things that I think is quite nice linking it to the sort of the, the revenue segmentation is I think with your own time, you've got to be disciplined and work out what, you, what you're starting, what you're stopping, what you're continuing with. Because obviously, mm -hmm. if you're wanting to move into this more strategic space, something's got to give. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you could apply that to yourself, couldn't you? Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. So, yeah. so I think there's consistency there. I, th I think the, the the one area where we can perhaps talk a bit more on on the questions is around that external analysis, because both in, in obviously in the presentation and what you've just said there, it's trying to get that benchmarking information. It's trying to get a feel: are your suppliers in a good financial place? Now, a lot of SME businesses, their suppliers are also SMEs, so the the, the accounts and the financial information to which they have access is, is relatively limited. Right, yeah. Um, so, so the abbreviated balance sheet. That's all. The abbreviated have. balance sheet. Yes. <laughs> does, does it balance? Yes, we're all right then. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so, have you, have you got any sort of hints and tips on, on where to find this information? Um, well, signing up to trade bodies is interesting, or or your local chamber, or or whatever, um, because they sometimes produce interesting reports the other thing though um and this is again from experience um and that, that sort of shows almost very clearly the the repositioning of that role i often went out to trade shows now when is a finance leader invited to attend a trade show that tends to only be for the sales and marketing people but i almost invited myself and then you put yourself in a position to talk to your customers, to talk to your suppliers, because they're all going to be there, to talk to other people in the industry, even competitors. And then, of course, asking questions, of course, with perhaps a bit of a finance hat on, but it's, it's that getting that exposure, putting yourself in a position where you are being exposed to your customers, to your suppliers, to your competitors even and engaging with them and asking questions. And clearly, hey, when you're talking to your competitor, they're not going to say, all right, well, here's our full set of accounts. Have a look at it. They're not going to do that. But by asking questions and listening carefully, that is actually an awful lot you can pick up. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you. So I'm just conscious of time. So uh, we just touched on the hour now. So um, there's a couple of other questions which we'll come back to people um, individually on. Um, so just take a bit of time to say thank you very much to all that have attended. Um, thank you to Tom. Thank you to Rene again uh, for, for, for the presentation. Um, there's some good links with some of the previous presentations. So if you check those out as well. Um, but any, any, any questions, uh, please get in contact with either Tom or myself and we'll be happy to help. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, yep. thanks Malcolm. Thanks, Rene. And thanks for everyone's time. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Malcolm. Thanks, everybody.